Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Welcome to worship on this third Sunday of Advent. We are glad that you are joining us however and whenever you participate in this service. Although we are physically separated, we are one in Christ Jesus. I want to remind you that today's bulletin is available on our website that you can, so you can follow along and join in the singing of our hymns. You can find it at fpcgreensboro.org and there is a children's bulletin available there as well. I also want to remind you that December 16th is the last Wednesday to drop off canned goods for Greensboro Urban Ministries. You can do that between 10 and 2 on North Elm Street. This is also your last opportunity to pick up your Christmas Eve communion and candlelight kits. I have an important reminder that the appointments committee needs your help. They need your help in selecting the next nominating committee. The nominating committee works to select the next class of elders. So please send your suggestions to Debbie Foster before the deadline of December 20th. The chancel flowers are given to the glory of God by Bob and Jean Rapp in memory of his parents, Robert C. and Eunice Jerome Rapp. We thank them for those beautiful flowers. We extend our Christian sympathy to those grieving the death of a loved one. We keep in our prayers the families of Carol Newton, who died November 25th, Stephen Trotter Sr., who died November 30th, Sanford Kyle S.K. Woolsley, who died December 5th. We thank God for the gift of their lives and for the gift of resurrection hope. Let us continue in worship as the Frick family leads us in our Advent candle lighting liturgy. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Jesus is the light of the world. When we follow our Lord, we do not need to be anxious about where we are going in the future, nor worry about where we have been in the past. One thing I ask of the Lord that we will seek after, and to live in the house of the Lord all days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in God's temple. Jesus is the light of the world. We come to worship today seeking to behold the beauty of the Lord and to ask God to help us reflect the light of the world wherever we go. On this second Sunday of Advent, we worship Jesus Christ, the light of the world who reveals to us the will of God. As we light the second candle, may its flame remind us to always look at, to Jesus Christ to guide us on our path.
brothers and sisters in Christ, each week we come to the font. This is the place we are named and claimed as God's own. God loves us and God yearns to be in relationship with us, especially the times that we choose to turn away and to live for ourselves. So I invite you with honesty and humility, wherever you are, seated or standing, come to the font and let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are coming in power to bring nations under your rule. We confess that we have not expected your judgment nor your kingdom. We have lived casual lives and ignored your promised judgment. Judge us, O God, for we have been slow to serve you. Forgive us for the sake of your faithful servant, Jesus, our Savior, whose triumph we want and eagerly await. And now in this quiet moment of worship, we lift up our hearts in personal confession. Children of God, hear the good news. This common element of water is the water of our baptism. It washes us clean, it restores our souls, it makes us whole again. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Know this and be at peace this day. And since God has forgiven us in Christ, we share that peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. I hope sometime today that you will pass the peace of Christ with others, often as the chancel choir does, texting it to one another. Send the peace of Christ to someone who needs to hear it today. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light. In your truth, find freedom, and in your word, discover peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. A reading from the book of Job. Listen for the word of God. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its ways, and do not stand in its paths. The murderer rises at dusk to kill the poor and needy, and in the night it's like a thief. The eye of the adulterer also waits for twilight, saying, no eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark, they dig through the houses. Day by day, they shut themselves up. They do not know the light, for the deep darkness is morning to all of them. They are friends with the terrors of the deep darkness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, which serve as the words of institution for the sacrament. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus Christ and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. I now introduce to you Debbie West, our elder. On behalf of the session, I present Thomas Bridge Pugh, 
son of Tyson and Collins, who for baptism.
the blessings of God follow you all the days of your life, and may you know that you are marked and sealed as God's own forever. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, let us clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. This is Thomas Bernard H. Pugh, child of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit forever in his baptism and marked forever as Christ's own. Let us pray. O Lord, uphold Thomas by your Holy Spirit, giving him spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. I'm so glad that you're joining us for worship today, and I invite the children to come a little bit closer to your screen for the children's message. I'm here again at our special worship table. If you were watching a couple weeks ago, you saw Miss Donna, who introduced our table and told you about some of the symbols that are on our table during this time of Advent. Advent's a time when we're waiting and preparing, getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So we have an Advent candle, wreath with our candles. We have a Bible have our nativity set. Maybe you have an advent calendar at home too. And today, I wanna to add one more thing to our table. Ta-da! I bet you see a lot of this at Christmas too, right? Presents, gifts, we see pictures of them, we have them under our tree. Maybe you're even buying some and wrapping some. And I bet if I could sit down and talk with you and ask you what is your favorite thing about Christmas, most of you would probably say, getting presents. It's pretty awesome. It really is. But it's not the most important thing about Christmas. The most important thing is inside my box. Got any guesses? If you have a guess, shout it out at your screen. I think I could almost hear some of you saying candy, but it's not candy. It's a heart. Inside my box was this red heart to symbolize love. Because we celebrate Christmas because God gave us the gift, right, of love when he sent us his only son, Jesus. Today we lit our third Advent candle on our wreath to symbolize love. And at Christmas, it's an important symbol that we don't see very often. It gets hidden under all the sparkly presents. So what I want you to do, if you got a family advent kit, you have one of these in here with your star and your lighthouse. If you didn't get a kit, that's okay. You can cut one out or draw one on a piece of paper. I want you to color it, decorate it, however you want to. And then, here's the important part. I want you to take your heart and I want you to go put it under your Christmas tree or maybe tuck it down in your stocking. Wherever you think you might find gifts on Christmas morning, I want you to put the heart right there. And on Christmas morning, when you're opening all those awesome gifts and having a great time, I hope that you will find that heart hidden there where you left it. And remember that the greatest gift is God's love that he sent in the form of Jesus Christ. And that that's really why we celebrate Christmas. The gifts are awesome, the candy's awesome, but it's really about Jesus and how God shows his love for us. So decorate your heart, go tuck it away, and find it again on Christmas morning. Let's pray together. 
Dear God, we thank you for loving us so much that you sent us such a wonderful gift in Jesus Christ. Help us to remember your love during this Advent season so that we can share your love with others and shine your light in the world. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes to us from the gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Are you familiar with deep darkness? Most of us are. It describes not only a time or a place, but a state of mind. Deep darkness in Hebrew is one word. It's found 17 times in the Old Testament. Nine of those 17 times, it's found in the book of Job. Job knows well that state of deep darkness, that feeling of despair and isolation and misery, that feeling of being abandoned, even by God. But this word, this Hebrew word for deep darkness is also found in the Psalms. And it is found in a Psalm that you likely know very well, Psalm 23. Here it is in the familiar King James Version. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, deep darkness is also translated as the shadow of death, that place and time and state where God walks alongside us in our deepest fears and in all of our finitude. Or maybe you remember this word from the prophet Isaiah in the glorious description of the coming Savior. The prophet proclaims, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. The psalmist and the prophet provide a different lens through which to see that which obliterates our bearings and renders us, at least for a time, unable to experience the joy that God intends for us. The judgment, John says, the crisis for us is when we reject the one who would save and sustain us when we need God the most. The crisis comes for us when we reject the one who walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, the one who comforts and guides us when we fear we are alone and we do not know where we are going. But why? Why would we ever reject the light of Christ? Why do we reject the one who dispels the shadow of death and brings us into the presence of God? Why do we choose deep darkness when the glory of God is so freely offered to us? I wonder if it isn't because we think that the light of Christ is just too good to be true. That's what grace is after all, right? It is too good to be true. 
and yet it is. That's the definition of grace. It is unearned. It is merciful. It is abundant. It is the very opposite of that which we deserve. And so we struggle with imagining that it is real. And that keeps us from embracing the one who comes to save us. After all, we live in a world that says people who believe the best in others, they're naive, they're gullible. They will be taken advantage of. Our culture, we relish when people get what's coming to them. We live in an economy of retribution, not a marketplace of grace. We hear things like there's no such thing as free lunch and uh, no good deed goes unpunished. We live in a cynical world. And while we may not be friends with the terrors of the deep darkness, we like Job know that there are people who are. And all of those companions of the shadow of death, well, they're everywhere, they're all around, they're ready to pounce. Our world, it traffics in fear and suspicion and disdain. And so we reject the light preemptively lest we look stupid for believing in a grace that transforms. We don't want to be gullible and believe in a mercy that doesn't hold grudges. How could we ever possibly believe that the meek will inherit the earth and the last will be first? We don't want to be fools for Christ to forgive 70 times seven times. The world doesn't operate like this. And if we're going to survive in it, well, we can't either. And while I know there are those who truly rebel against the light, I think many of us just don't want to be duped by it. Because grace, both receiving and extending it, it makes us vulnerable. And being vulnerable is frightening. But living in the shadow of death is no life at all. Walling ourselves off from the love of God and from loving others renders us residents of the deep darkness of despair and loneliness and fear. And that is the opposite of the abundant life that Jesus comes to give. And that judgment comes, that crisis comes when we have to choose. Are we going to be seeing flaws and all? in the light or are we going to keep hiding in the dark because we are vulnerable either way we are finite and frail our failings are inescapable our sin is ever before us but that is exactly why Jesus became incarnate that is exactly why Jesus comes into this world to seek and save the lost to shine light on those who are dwelling in deep darkness. To tell us that we are more than the worst thing we've ever done. And even all of those things we intend for evil, God can use for good. Do we believe this? Our culture says otherwise, doesn't it? Three strikes and you're out. But Jesus says, forgive others as God has forgiven you. Jesus says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Jesus does not write off the garrison demoniac or Zacchaeus. He goes to those relegated to the shadow of death and even to those who have chosen to make friends with deep darkness. He seeks them out to heal and transform. Do we believe this? Do we believe that Jesus has the power to do this in our own lives and in the lives of others? Believing in this kind of amazing grace will make us vulnerable. 
We will have to see ourselves as we really are and ask God to change us to make us more like Christ. If we believe in this kind of amazing grace, we're going to be vulnerable because we're going to see others as beloved and worthy of our care, even when they act in ways that obscure the image of God in them. If we embrace this amazing grace, we will be vulnerable to the world that is yearning to get out of the shadow of death and have some resurrection hope. To believe in this kind of grace makes us vulnerable to being hurt when people choose the terrors of deep darkness, when we really desperately want them to know the joy of this one precious life. To believe and act out of this kind of mercy makes us vulnerable. We might be labeled foolish or naive or gullible or worse. We might get taken advantage of from time to time. The forgiveness we extend, it might not be reciprocated. Even with the best of intentions, we will injure those closest to us and do the very things we hate. And that is exactly why Jesus comes to this earth. That is why while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is why even after we abandon and deny Christ, he says to us, I will make you nothing less than my body on earth, the church. Do we believe this? Do we believe it? I read a wonderful article in The Bitter Southerner, which is a great online journal if you don't know it. It was written by Tom Lee, and he traveled through central Appalachia where he found stories of hope, community, and creativity in the most unlikely of places. Places often known for their deep darkness and their despair and all the things that they lack. One story he calls Lunch, Beer, and Jesus. He visits a brewery. It's located in St. Paul, Virginia, which has a population of 840. He meets a Methodist couple, Greg and Jennifer Bailey, and they decided to open a brewery and they learned quickly there's not an abundance of human resources in their area. So they hired people others wouldn't. They hired the formerly incarcerated. And Jennifer says, we got to know some people who worked here. We hired them because, you know, at times you're desperate in a little town like this. And we have grown to love so many people. We understand they are human beings. And that's the best byproduct of this restaurant. We have learned to love people who are different from us. People who I probably wouldn't have given the time of day to before. And then she said, if we don't give them a chance, what's their hope? What are they going to do if you treat them like a leper? Tell me what they're supposed to do. Now, not everyone in town supports the Baileys. Some in their own church have questioned not just their hiring practices, but their faith. But Jennifer told a fellow church member, we love people. We love everybody. That kind of love makes us vulnerable to criticism or worse. But it expands our capacity for compassion and it causes us to walk in the light of Christ and bring others out from the shadow of death too. There's a false security in staying in the dark, pleading ignorance about our own sin and condemning others for theirs. 
but that false security comes at the cost of living in the light and knowing what it means to be forgiven and freed and fully inexplicably loved. Lee also wrote about a place called the Black Sheep Brick Oven Bakery. It's in an area of Kentucky that no longer even has a school. It's a former mining town. The founders, Gwen Johnson and her nephew Brad, came up with the idea while Brad was in prison. After he was released, they registered as a nonprofit, they got grant funding, and they got to work alongside their friend Evelyn Atkins, also formerly incarcerated. Lee writes this, Thursdays and Saturdays, the black sheep sells fresh baked bread, cinnamon rolls, and other sweets, all fashioned from Gwen's original sourdough starter. It's on Friday nights, however, that Brad fires up the 800 degree brick oven. Adkins measures out the sourdough into 271 gram balls for crust and the bakery becomes a pizza joint, Fleming Neon's only functioning restaurant. In no time, the room fills, a band swells, children dance, there is community again. Lee says, if you ask me how to explain what I saw, what I felt, I can only explain the quickening in my heart and the sting in my eyes in one word, reconciliation. The Johnsons and Adkins were reconciling themselves to their people, to their past, as well as their present. They were reconciling their neighbors one to another. The dogged refusal to be turned away or to turn anyone away was palpable. Community, reconciliation, joy, hope, dancing in the most unlikely places with the least and the lost, those once far off and those with nowhere else to go. Even in mountains of pain and valleys overshadowed by death, grace upon grace. For sinners, for us, it is as if the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them, light has shone. Do we believe this? Because whether we believe it or not, it is the gospel truth. And the truth will set us free. Amen.
Having heard the word read and proclaimed, please join me in our affirmation of faith. Jesus Christ is the living word of God. The word which was with God from the beginning was embodied in Jesus Christ. We hold that what God says to us and does for us centers in Jesus Christ, our living Lord, as he is remembered, known, and expected. In Christ, God's word of acceptance takes flesh. By grace through faith, we are set right with God, adopted as children of God, not because of anything we have done, but because of what Christ has done. In Christ, God's word of demand is lived out. To love God and neighbor as he did is what God requires of us. The Spirit adds no different word from God, but leads us deeper into the truth of God uttered in Jesus Christ. Now please join me in prayer. God of all kindness, you gave your only son because you loved the world so much. We pray for the peace of the world. Move among us by your spirit break down barriers of fear, suspicion, and hatred, heal the human family of its division, and unite it in the bonds of justice and peace. We pray for our country, enrich our common life, strengthen the forces of truth and goodness, teach us to share prosperity, that those whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. We pray for those who suffer. Surround them with your love, support them with your strength, console them with your comfort, and give them hope and courage beyond themselves. We pray for our families, for those whom we love, protect them at home, support them in times of difficulty and anxiety, that they may grow together in mutual love and understanding and rest content in one another. We pray for the church, keep us true to the gospel and responsive to the gifts and needs of all. Make known your saving power in Jesus Christ by the witness of our faith, our worship, and our life. We pray all of these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
in response to the proclamation of the word and the movement of the Holy Spirit, we are called to offer up our very lives in service to God. It is possible to give financially on the FPC website. Let us now continue the worship of God with the offering of music. Sing of Mary, pure and lowly, Virgin Mother undefiled. Sing of God's own Son, most holy, who became her. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen.